Guidus and can't talk. He, he called in uh, yesterday midday, and Beth has been kind enough to, instead of October, to speak tonight, which we're very happy about. I have some housekeeping to do first, and I'm, I'm starting a little early, but I want to get into it. The first thing is walking tours. Well, no, the first thing is membership. We're in the middle of our membership drive. We've got a lot of new members, older members. There's still people in this room that haven't signed up. Membership forms are in the back. I hope you will do that. We do now two walking tours a year. And uh, those are coming up now. Uh, the evening of the 21st of May, starting at 6.30, those of you who willing to want to come. We'll be meeting at Taylor Alderdice and doing the Marlfield area, which is a repeat from last year. What we try to do is do each walk a couple of times. And then on the Saturday, June 7th, we'll be doing from here, we'll be doing the Central Business District of Squirrel Hill. You don't have to duck. Do you want to hang your coat up? Cut prices. It's $3 for members, $5 for non-members. There are sign-up forms in the back. Uh, I will cut both of these talks off at, uh, these walks off at 25 people. So get, get your sign up sheets in the back. Our, our docent just can't be effective with more than that. So that, that's what we've been doing. But this is now a tradition with us, and I hope you all enjoy doing what we did. Last time the Morrowfield talk was on Saturday, the walk. And this time it will be in the evening. Uh, so that maybe some of the people who can't come on Saturday to tours can do the Marfield this year. And we'll probably do the Central Business District for two years. Uh, next thing, um, on April 6th, the library is having a Squirrel Hill Day. It's a new thing they're going to do. And we are going to, I've been asked to be on a panel, but we're probably going to ask be asked to... Uh, help set up a booth there, that's what I understand. I would like, you know, usually a few of us get stuck doing those kind of events. I would like to uh, have some other volunteers to help us do that. Anyone who's available to should talk to Patty uh, in the back and let us know that you can help out, both in terms of maybe manning the booth and helping set it up. Other thing, we got a request from uh, the Rivers of Steel. Everyone know what the Rivers of Steel is? It's down, it's going to be a National Historic Park within the next three or four years, in which they are um, uh, sort of, what's it, Elizabeth Furnace, and some of the other leftovers from the steel industry are being renovated and turned into a national park. And the, the group that is responsible for that, and they have a nice office down in Homestead, is going to put together a neighborhood exhibit, which will last from July 1st of this year to January, in which they're going to celebrate all the neighborhoods that surround River of Steel. And frankly, what we've been asked to do is to contribute a series of photographs and some narrative, which they then are going to select out and will be part of exhibits and then a book that they're going to put out, the neighborhoods of the River of Steel. And again, I would hope that there's some photographers in this room that would let Patty in the back know and not leave it to the four or five of us that do most of the extra work on this to help out and participate because we would really like to do that. We're going to have the Rivers of Steel come next in December, we don't time till then, and talk about what they are doing, the plans for the National Historic Park and the history of, of, of the steel mills there, which we've not we've we've had talks about Carnegie and Frick, but we've not really had one in terms of the mill properties, so we're gonna do that. Um, last thing before we put Beth up is uh, in terms of next meetings. Next month we're going to hear about the courthouse and the jail and Henry Richardson, the, uh, the architect, uh, someone who does docent tours down there is going to be here. And then, um, you know, I'm forgetting of our own talks. And I, I need a list. Uh, but we're going to have a talk in July on the, uh, uh, 
on the Pittsburgh Pirates. June is this bagpiping. Is, pardon me? Oh, we've, June. Got, we've got a bagpiper coming who's going to give a concert and also uh, sell like CDs. That. Talk about the history of bagpipes. <clears throat> and, uh, this this uh, we're going to, oh, before that, in May, in May Jim Cunningham from QED is going to come. And I had asked him to come without realizing that it's an anniversary of QED, so it's very good timing. And in the fall, thanks to requests from members who are sitting in this room, we're going to have a talk on the, the mines under Squirrel Hill in September. And, and then in October, November, we're talking to at least one other group. We like to do um, getting to know your neighbors, some of the other groups uh, in the area. We haven't done one this year, but we'll have that probably in October. So that's what we have to look forward to. So sign up. Be a member, uh, although you can come without being a member. Uh, do the walking tours, and uh, hopefully a few of you will come and talk to Patty in the back about having time to work on these two special events, the April 6th and then the photography exhibit. Um, our speaker tonight is our angel. Uh, Beth Rourke, a professor of art history at uh, Chatham. Uh, most of you know this story, but I always tell it. You know, we have our nice Squirrel Hill book that is now sold 3,200 or 3,500. Beth, I don't know if you knew that. Um, and Arcadia Publishing has taken over the book world. Uh, you know, every time you go to Barnes and Nobles, there are more and more of them from here and everywhere else. Uh, they have been trying to get this group to do a book on Squirrel Hill for some time with my predecessor as chairman, and there have never been enough of sources of photographs to do it. We, we used to exhibit every summer at the Squirrel Hill Day, Squirrel Hill Happening in the summer, and one day, Beth Work from Chatham walks by, I wasn't there at the time, and informs us that there's this marvelous collection of Squirrel Hill photographs that really turns out never really been used by anyone and that it was available to us. And it, we lurched forward and it took a while. But in the end, the collection from Chatham became about two-thirds of the book that we put out in terms of photographs. A little background to that, there are other photographs in town, none, none as good as this, but the library, Carnegie Library, and the, the university all charge. And for a group like this, we didn't have the money to go out and spend fifty dollars a picture. So without this collection, the book never would have happened. We've had talks on Chatham before, although Beth, who's spoken to us, has not talked about Chatham. She talked about other issues. So tonight, snow is gone, and let's go. <laughs> <laughs> Light. Most of these slides are very different. old and have never been digitized. I brought maps for everyone. Um, it's kind of hard if you don't know Chatham well to follow along with all the changes. So I'll pass these around. I hope there's enough for everybody to get one. This is a map that was done in 2004 by um, the base on a grant we received from the Getty Foundation to do historic um, research on our buildings and our landscape, which was really interesting. We learned a lot about what Chatham was before anything was there. And um, it was worked on by a local architectural firm that's noted down there, Fathman and Associates. It's a little bit out of date. It's 2004. And if you've walked through Chatham recently, you know that we've done a lot of building over the last couple of years, which I'll talk about. Um, my emphasis tonight is on the architecture and the changing landscape. And an overview, a brief overview of the history of the college. If you can't hear me, let me know, because I know the slide projector is kind of loud. But I'm used to projecting. I teach in large classrooms. Um, we began as the Pennsylvania's, Pennsylvania Female College in 18. 69, we became, in 1890, Pennsylvania College for Women, and then in 18, 1955, sorry, 1955, we became Chatham College, and then last year, Chatham University. If you walk down on campus today, they've just redone the back end of Mellon Hall, and they put all 
for names and the dates of when you were that particular name. Um, again, today we're going to focus on the architecture and the landscape. It's got a fantastic range of architectural styles on campus uh, that really reflect the eclecticism of the late 19th and the 20th century. It's a fascinating place for me to work. When I tell people I work at Chatham, they always say, oh, how lucky you are. It's such a beautiful place. And it really is wonderful as an art historian. <coughs> it has kind of a complex history, though, particularly its physical history. So I gave you, you know, one thing that's confusing is they would tear down buildings and get, then give the name to a new building. And so it's, <laughs> it can get confusing, but I'll point out where we are on the map. Um, again, Pennsylvania Female College it was chartered in 1869 as one of the first liberal arts colleges for women, um, founded primarily by powerful men who attended Shadyside Presbyterian Church. But we have no affiliation with the Presbyterians. They were the ones who started Chatham, mostly because they wanted their daughters to have an education equal to that that their sons could receive. Um, it, it was also the result of an attitude change at the time. After the Civil War, there was the concept of the new woman, the woman who had equal access to education, who had greater freedom outside the home. If anybody saw the Off the Pedestal show at the Frick Art Museum um, last year, I think it was, it was all about this concept of the new woman, um, wearing shirt waist instead of wearing bustles and corsets, um, smoking cigarettes, riding bicycles, cutting bangs apparently was quite the radical thing to do in the 1890s. So if you see a photograph or a portrait of someone in that from that period with bangs, that means she's kind of a radical feminist. So. I learned something new from it. We actually did a little exhibition about Chatham as part of that show using some of our, our archival photographs because, again, Chatham was the result of this concept of the new woman. Um, it may have been named in response to some of our girls in 1890 s um, The name may have been in response to the Pittsburgh Female College, which was downtown. This is an image of the Pittsburgh Female College. It was more, though, of a seminary, kind of a finishing school for women, whereas, again, Chatham was intended to offer a curriculum that was equal to the colleges for men, the curricula at colleges for men, including math courses and science. We've had that from the beginning. The first classes began at Chatham in 1870, and the original college building was Barry Mansion. And on your map, it's where the Braunfall College complex <coughs> is, kind of a three-part building. That's where Barry was. And it was, I've heard this several times, believed to be the largest domestic structure in Allegheny County at the time it was given to the college. And it was on top of the hill where Chatham is today, um, approximately <coughs> four miles from the point. The hilltop was actually an ancient, eroded Appalachian upland plain that overlooked a wide glacial valley. The glacial Valley is now Shadyside and East Liberty. Um, Chatham is actually on the edge of an old river. And between about 1750 and 1850, the whole area was farmland. That didn't change until 1853, when the Pennsylvania Railroad came in to East Liberty. And they built the trolleys and Pittsburgh, or Shadyside, East Liberty and what was called the Heights, where Chatham was, really became the first suburb of Pittsburgh, one of the earliest suburbs of downtown Pittsburgh. Um, and the area became part of the city in the 1860s. Woodland Road, which you'll see on your map, it's the road that winds through the college. Actually, there's east and there's north and there's west Woodland Road now. It's quite complicated. <coughs> but Woodland Road was built in 1853. So they did have a road that moved through. Um, the Murray Hill Avenue area, which runs along the side of campus, it's the Belgian Block Road that kind of touches on, this, on the campus, um, was first developed, I think it's the, some of the earliest homes in Squirrel Hill are there. And it was developed during the Civil War with mostly Gothic revival style villas and cottages. What made, as you probably know, the biggest, this is when the home was still owned by the Barry family, and you see members of the family outside the home. But as you probably know, the thing that really made this area blossom was 
putting trolleys down Fifth Avenue. And I've got a few pictures. This is actually looking down Fifth Avenue. You can see Third Presbyterian Church right here. And some of these homes, I think, are still there on Fifth Avenue. And I, so many of them are <coughs> now. You can see the trolley lines. This is another view. This is looking down towards Beachwood Boulevard from just past where the college is. Again, Belgian blocks of the trolley lines. Yeah. It's actually a cable car. Oh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> you don't know my transportation. And another view. You're there you can see the cables. This is actually, I think, a fifth and shading. Yeah, this is, these are some of the slides that came from our collection. The reason we have such a good collection of slides is that a professor who used to teach at Chatham, Arthur Smith, wrote the book, the original Pittsburgh Then and Now, that had all the images of Pittsburgh Then and Pittsburgh Now. Um, he passed away about a year before I came to the college, and these things were sitting in boxes, and they ended up with me because I was the art historian and I used slides, and I really didn't look at them. You know, until I actually had to move from my slide library, and then I realized what a gold mine we really have. They still, our goal is hopefully to get them all scanned and put on, online and made accessible to people. But he did a lot of um, turning archival photographs from all over the city into, um, into slides for classes that he taught at the college. Um, the very estate, which you see here with when the college owned it, was about 10 and a half acres. Um, it was built by George A. Berry, who was a glassmaker and a banker and a founding member of the college's board of trustees. The house was built around 1861, so they actually didn't live in it very long before it came to the college. And as you can see, the style really reflects that kind of romantic revival style. Some Gothic details of the pointed windows and the um, the gingerbread along the turrets. Um, it's, there are some comments made at the time when this house joined or became the college that initially apparently had beautiful plantings in front of it as well, um, <coughs> Victorian bedding plants that they lost after the college got it because they needed the space. But a prospectus for the college in 1870 wrote, for beauty of situation, for taste dis displayed in its improvement, for healthfulness, the location cannot be improved, up improved upon. So it really was, a, from what I've seen in pictures, a beautiful structure. It contained all college functions, classrooms, dining hall, dormitory for students, and also for faculty who lived on campus, and a gymnasium. It's all of this one building. And um, by about 1890, the landscape had been simplified and it had become a more institutional kind of drive with walks. I do have a few pictures of the interior. It kind of breaks my heart to look at them because, of course, the building isn't there anymore. And it was torn down in the 50s before preservation became such an important part of our culture. Oh, there's another. This is Miss Pike's Latin class <laughs> sitting outside of Ferry Hall. There's Miss Pike on the lower left over there. Happy <laughs> this is the entry hall to Old Barry. Here's an upstairs hall. Again, breaks my heart. <coughs> Apparently it's just a gorgeous building. And this was the original college library. So um, we also have an exterior view of a graduation around 1902 the girls all dressed in white, and you can see there's a boardwalk that's been put in, and this is one corner of Barry Hall. <clears throat> now between 1887 and 1900, you have what's called the old campus expansion. By 1887, they run out of room, as you can imagine. They realized that additional space was needed, and so they began a fundraising campaign, and the result was Dilworth Hall, which was the first building built just for the college. It was actually attracted or attached to Barry. Um, so it too is where the Braunfall Coolidge complex is today, or it was. Um, it was funded mostly by the Dilworth family, which is why it's called Dilworth Hall. Um, as you can see, I'm going to stick with this for a minute. It's neo Romanesque, uh, the kind of style that Henry Hobson Richardson was working in when he built our courthouse downtown that you'll hear about next month. 
Uh, it included a chapel that set 650 classrooms, labs, dorm rooms, and was three stories. It was connected over here to Barry by a corridor. So this is a drawing that was in the um, our alumni reporter, which is our alumni magazine when Dilworth was first built. And you can see Barry over here, and then the corridor, and then this is Dilworth. And just note the kind of rounded Romanesque windows. We're going to look at an interior shot now. That's where the chapel was, and it was a meeting place for the whole campus and also a place for services. This is an image that was also in that alumni recorder. It's a drawing, as you can see, of the chapel. Um, and inset here, what's over here is the college's Tiffany window, which is actually what I talked about the first time I came here, if people remember. Um, it had stained glass windows throughout. There's a graduation <coughs> shot here. You can see again, you've got stained glass windows, the Tiffany window <coughs> right here. Um, and just, I'm not going to repeat that talk, but it was a window commissioned from Lewis Comfort Tiffany by the brand new Alumni Association in 1889. And um, they were asked what they wanted to give to the new building, and they decided, you can see it says Alumni Association, 1873 to 1888, celebrating the graduating classes. The first, again, classes began in 1870, so the first graduating class was 1873. And um, what they did was solicit designs from eight glass designers. We don't know who the other eight were. I would love to know. Four said they would do it for free, and Tiffany was one of those four. We don't know who the other three were, but there was a wonderful article in um, the Alumni Recorder that talks about the dis deciding process, that there was one window that he, they said looked like Greek maidens, two Greek maidens in a modern setting, and they, to let the designer down softly, they said, oh, it was too expensive for them. So then the designer said, well, we can get rid of one of the ladies and make it $100 less. So they said it was interesting to know the worth of a woman at that time. But um, this has just been, well, not just, it's probably been six or seven years now, it's just been restored and reinstalled in our science building. I'll show you the science building later. Um, Tiffany in 1889 was not the name that he became. He really became a household name after 1893 and his exhibition at the World's Columbian. So they were you know, taking a risk. They really didn't know much about him. We not only have the window, um, which you can see has uh, what's supposed to be a symbol of knowledgeable womanhood in the middle, surrounded by rondelles that have the names of all great men, which is kind of distressing <laughs> since it's a woman's college. Um, we also have Tiffany's original design, and you can see that originally there was a simple sunburst in the arch and a very elaborate lintel. And um, that lintel was never made, but the sunburst became a much more elaborate kind of floral design, more flowers and ribbons. So um, we don't know who picked the names. We don't know if it was the alums who picked the names or if Tiffany picked the names. And we've always been curious about why there are two Shakespeare's. You can see Shakespeare's down here. And he's also up there. And uh, I had my students research the window for an exhibition. And we realized that above are all great literary figures, with Homer, the inventor of the epic poem, at the top. And down here are, are people famous in other areas. There's two artists, Michelangelo and Raphael, scientist Pliny, Plato for philosophy, Galileo for science. So you think Shakespeare's down here to represent the literary arts within these other kind of areas of knowledge. It had, um, unfortunately, this, uh, this I should say, it was based on the Arithmian Sibyl. If you know your Sistine ceiling, Sistine Chapel ceiling, she might look familiar to you. You'll notice that um, there's one little genius here, a little winged figure lighting the lamp of knowledge. And on the book is our motto, this motto of the college, which is, may our daughters be as cornerstones polished after the similitude of the palace, I think. It's from Psalms. That's it at the bottom in black. <laughs> and here's Michelangelo's version where there's actually two geniuses, one little one who's rubbing its eyes. The Erythrian Sibyl, um, you can see, is quite the bulky woman. Michelangelo, of course, was not able to study from a female nude. 
So we studied male nudes, so she's got her kind of six-pack abs, <laughs> big arms, and that's carried over onto our window as well. Ours too has got, you know, <laughs> kind of a large She's on the Sistine ceiling. Let me find her. She's one of these figures here. Here she is. Here with Rian Sybil, one of the one of the prophets and Sybils um, that appear on the Sistine ceiling. This is an image that I found in our archives. So I guess the thing to do around the turn of the century was for women to keep these huge archives that had their or huge kind of picture books and memory books that had their dance cards in them and their place card settings and. One had photographs in it, and I noticed that it had the back side of the window. And I think from the clothes, it's maybe 19-teens, maybe 1907, 19-teens. The window, however, became very dirty. You know, it was open to the, it was on the exterior of the building, so it just, it was made with layers of glass. It was before Tiffany invented his famous multicolor glass, so he would layer glass and this milky kind of carbon stuff because of Pittsburgh air got in between the layers of the ice and that you can see had broken in places as well. So they created it up and for some reason kept it for 70 some years, which is amazing because most people by the 1920s were throwing out their Tiffany because it was out of style. This is our class of 1889, the class right after the window was built. Um, in 1896, the college added a narrow lot that extended the campus to Murray Hill Avenue, and they built there behind Barry a gym and a powerhouse, which I've never seen pictures of. Um, it's also at this time in the 1890s that two Woodland Road houses that the college would later acquire were built. And I found this map in my Arthur Smith slides. This is Pittsburgh in 1889. I know it's kind of hard to see. But it's a map that was, I think, done by the Union Trust Building, because here's the Union Trust Building over here. And it shows, it's, I would love to get this blown up, or at least see it in better resolution. Um, but it shows Pittsburgh right at this time in 1889. The two houses that were built are on Woodland Road, um, the Shingle Style Baby House, or Baby Hall. Um, which was designed, we think, by Alden and Harlow, who did the Carnegie Museum of Art, the Carnegie Institute, right around the same time. Um, it was formerly known as Sunset Hill, and then it was named for, um, I think, a famous alum. So that's the baby house built around 1894. We know the addition to it was built by Alden and Harlow in 1904. That's why they think that perhaps the whole thing was done by Alden and Harlow. And you can see it on the map, it's called of course, Baby Hall, and it's a shingle-style house. Um, you can see the shingles, the large porches, the multiple gables, all the characteristics that identify it as a shingle-style home. The other house that was built around this time, we think around 1893, is Barry Hall, which is kind of on the other end of campus. Um, if you take the Woodland Avenue road, road in off of Wilkins, it's the first college building you'll see on the right. And they think it's probably the oldest building in this area that still exists on Woodland Road. It was built around 1893, thought to be designed by Peabody and Stairns, and um, very characteristic of the federal revival style at the time. As you can see, it's very beautifully balanced, like colonial and federal buildings were, has lots of classical detailing. So that's when these were built. They didn't come to the college, though, for some time. The school changed its name to Pittsburgh College for Women in 1890 in response to student requests for a more modern-sounding name, because they didn't like Pennsylvania Female College, so it became the College for Women. Um, it's around this time that they began to make the girls do these forced walks for their health. And you, if you read histories of the college, you hear multiple complaints about them being forced to walk up and down Fifth Avenue regardless of the weather because it was good for their health. Um, after 1907, um, they began to think about building a freestanding building, another building in addition to the Dilworth um, um, Barry complex. And that building was Woodland Hall. It's a building that's kind of hard to see today. It was originally to front on Chapel Hill Drive. It's the oldest building built for the college that still exists. 
but there have been multiple later additions to it, so it just doesn't have the charm I think it did originally. Again, it too was built by Alden and Harlow with an arts and crafts slash tutor influence in 1909. And initially, Chapel Hill Drive is the drive that goes up the hill to the chapel. That's in front here. And it had this large open porch, which is now closed in. The entrance to the building was over here. I don't have a picture of it, but I have a drawing. It looks like it was just gorgeous, beautiful entrance. Unfortunately, that's all gone now. I mean, it's funny because when you look on the building, you can see where these parts have been removed. It's just kind of a flat door now. Unfortunately, again, preservation was not a priority at that point in time. Um, the entrance, this entrance faced Dilworth. The other building that was built as a separate building for the college was Lindsay House, which is on the other side of Woodland Hall, going up Chapel Hill, uh, kind of between Woodland and the Mellon Mansion. And I don't have a photo of it, but I have a nice drawing. It too was um, it, it built in the Oh, arts and crafts style, which was consistent again with the neighborhood with Murray Hill Avenue and the mansions going up along Woodland Road. It's been probably four different things. And I've been a chap for about 11 years. It's been four different things. Right now, it's our English department building. So they're really lucky, their faculty, have, you know, because as well as a house, their faculty have these beautiful big offices. Um, and it was built as the president's residence by Thomas Hanna in 1910. A couple other pictures of our girls from around this time. I think these are looking like 1910, 19-teens. We participated actively in the suffrage movement, and this is a Chatham suffrage float from the 19-teens. You can see it says Pennsylvania College for Women, and it has the college crest, which is based on um, Pittsburgh Seal. And you can see some of the girls up there dressed as kind of Greek maidens. And I guess some, I don't know what the men are doing there. If they build a float or <laughs> they're helping move the float, or I'm not quite sure. But that was a parade that was in downtown Pittsburgh fighting for suffrage for women. Here again, around, I'm thinking the same time, 1910s, 19-teens, 1920s. Um, both of these structures, Lindsay House and Woodland, were built with a great deal of sensitivity to picturesque placement in the landscape. Both are buildings that are, are just beautifully seated in terms of the landscape. There's around this time that there's stories of girls sneaking past Lindsay House, past the president's house, to smoke cigarettes at a fence in the back that, broke, that divided college land from private land and they watched cows and smoked cigarettes there. <laughs> um, between 1910 and 1920, of course, the neighborhood grew substantially. Again, this to me looks 1920s-ish, and that looks like Dilworth or maybe Barry in the background. Um, it's around this time that the Mellon Mansion was built and a number of adjoining homes on Woodland Road. This was built actually for George M. Lachlan of Lachlan and Steel, Lachlan and Jones Steel in 1907. It was also designed by McClure and Spawn, and it too is in a Tudor style. Um, they actually purchased, Lachlan purchased two lots from the college to build it. And you're looking now at the back end of it. It's hard to get a picture, a good picture of the front end because you're right on the road. This is actually the part that they've just restored. If you haven't been on campus since, I guess it opened in the fall, um, there were some um, ADA, American Disabilities Act, issues that they had to make the building more accessible, and we also added some new programs that needed housing down there. So if you go today, you'll see that this is all very new looking, and we're putting it kind of better to the state of, of the building itself. Um, so he built that in 1907. During this time, around the turn of the century, is when Chatham was holding his famous May Day celebrations, which I think went on for some time. There's just tons of images of them in our archives. So I just brought in a few, because my understanding was they used to attract thousands of people to the college to watch these May Day celebrations. Actually, this is the cover of our Squirrel Hill um, history book, and it's a picture of Chatham um, girls doing the Maypole in front of Barry Hall. I was thrilled when I saw that that was the cover. <laughs> One of the May Queens, early May Queen. 
a slightly different angle. Rockland's over here. Um, here's Buell, and then here's um, the Bronfall Coolidge Complex. Just to give you an idea of, again, this is the small quadrangle. Um, and there was proposed construction of a new science building, which was built, a library which was built, an assembly hall and a chapel, and an administrative building that were not built at this time. Because you can see the date, 1929, 1930, <laughs> the big depression, you know, Great Depression hit. And um, then slowed down the building of the master plan. It basically, basically stopped it for a good bit of time. Um, it was beautifully sighted once again. Chatham has gorgeous views from up there if you've never been. Particularly along here, you can see over at East Liberty and over Shady Side. Um, this is where the addition to the science building will go, where the Tiffany window is today. And it's open, it's a classroom building, so it's open pretty much all the time. If you walk down kind of past Walkland um, and go back this way, you can see the Tiffany window as it is installed. Um, Let's see, I have a few pictures. This is the Buell Science Building. Again, um, there's a plaque up there, and I found a letter in the archives that was soliciting the names of famous scientists to carve on the facade of the building. This is something that big buildings did a lot. If you go down to the Carnegie and look around the roof line, you see that same kind of great men along the roof line. And again, kind of sadly, it has no win in it. And this was built by <coughs> Adam Curie, but it's all a list of men's names. This is it at a kind of more romantic time when I guess they thought that Ivy was okay for a building. Again, our girls now heading into the, I think, the 30s and 40s. Um, Melvin and Smith also designed one of the additions to Woodland, which we'll see right around this time. Again, they needed more space. This was a slide I found that um, I was interested in because it shows Chatham girls at the American Painting or Painting of the United States exhibition. The Carnegie International, of course, which is coming up very shortly, was begun in 1896 and was intended to be a contemporary view of uh, international art. Of course, during the war, during the Second World War, they couldn't get art really from anywhere else, so it became painting in the United States. So these date to the war years. This picture dates to the war years, and you can see the catalog there. And they're Chatham women at the Painting of the United States show at the Carnegie. Here again is another one of those Union Trust maps, which I really want to see <laughs> much better. This is 18, 1939, so Pittsburgh's growing and changing, as is Chatham. Now, the Mellon bequest, again, it was Laughlin's home. Mellon bought it in 1917. This is a picture that's in the Squirrel Hill book, and it actually um, is a visit by President Taft, who you see here, to Laughlin, because it was 1910, so he would have still owned the house at that time. And there's um, some other famous people back there. That kind of looks awful lot to me, like Andrew Mellon, but I'm not sure it is, since it's fairly early. And apparently Taft came out and greeted some of the girls from the college who came up to Mellon Hall. Mellon enlarged the home, hiring E.P. Mellon, a relative, in 1970 to add a greenhouse. This is a picture of Mellon. I don't know where and I don't know who was with him, but <laughs> it's in there. I thought it was a nice picture. And it's not in front of Mellon. They added a greenhouse and a carriage house. The carriage house is now our bookstore. It's behind, kind of behind Mellon. They added eight acres of grounds, which were landscaped, um, a lodge, which is still today on our athletic field, and unfortunately I think being used for storage of athletic equipment. We're, our department is now in the gym, and we're just, we really want that lodge. We really want to do something <laughs> fun with it. Um, tennis courts, which were recently torn down to build our, um, our new athletic facility. Gardens, an orchard, a pond, the pond still exists. Um, a bowling alley and a swimming pool. Now the, lands, the landscape was designed by the Olmsted brothers, who were the sons of Frederick Law Olmsted, who designed Central Park, was probably the most famous landscape architect of the 19th century. We actually, the college has had a lot of uh, communication with the Olmsted archives, and there's, they went on to do a master plan for the college as well, so um, we're lucky to have that kind of connection. 
um, it was in 1919 that Olmsted, the Olmsted brothers designed the estate grounds, um, which adjoined the college's original campus um, when we got the bequests south to Woodward Road, so it extended the college's campus south. Um, at his father's death in 1937, Paul Mellon gave the estate to the college, so that's when it came to us. He had taken Lachlan's home, which wasn't nearly as big, and added just tons of stuff, um, including kind of going, this is an earlier view of it, again from the back side. You can see the pond down there. Um, he went to Europe and kind of raided, as he was known to do, Tudor castles <laughs> and took out, you know, original Tudor woodwork to put in the Mellon Mansion. Um, this is around this, the fireplace on the first floor. There's also these gorgeous sconces that we had someone come in and, and kind of look at the things we had around still because so much had been sold off in the 1980s. And um, the person we brought in was so excited about these sconces. He said, oh, a pair of sconces just like this sold for $25,000 you know, at auction recently. So anyway, there's some beautiful stuff in the building. Um, and it remained. Um, today is primarily administration, and you can see that a large addition, Anderson Dining Hall, was built on to it in the 60s. Okay, again, science classes, again, I'm thinking 1940s. After the Mellon request, the college began expanding the focus of campus planning to a self-contained hilltop complex spread to Woodland Road Estates. The Mellon bequest inspired um, gifts of the other houses over time. Um, we received Thickest House in 1944, and again, this is looking down the side of Thickest. Um, there was an addition built to connect Thickest to its carriage house, and Thickest is the building that looks very long on the plan, and it's right next to a home that was des designed by Gropius. I mean, if you're familiar with the neighborhood, you know there's a major modern architecture in that Woodland Road neighborhood. Gropius, of course, was the leader of the Bauhaus. And that's a house that today is still in the family that ordered it. Um, unfortunately, it's, I understand, not in very good shape. And I don't think it's going to go to the college because they, the guy who owns it does not like the college. Um, there's also uh, Meyer, Richard Meyer, who designed the Getty Museum. There's that white Meyer house that's right on Woodland Road that looks totally out of place. But it's a beautiful example of Meyer's architecture. And behind it, um, Robert Venturi, they call it the Paddle Wheel House. It's that kind of greenhouse that goes over a stream. Robert Venturi wrote on um, Learning from Las Vegas. He was one of the first postmodern architects. So um, anyway, we purchased Fick or we purchased Ficus in 1944. It was a 1947 edition that connected it with the carriage house. Um, this was designed by Ingham and Boy, who had designed the noted Chatham Village, which we have nothing to do with, but it was the same designers, and of course, um, in Arthur Smith's slides, there were tons of shots of Chatham Village because it's so important as um, you know, as a designed complex of homes and apartments. This is another view of Chatham Village, again, no connection. <laughs> um, it was built in 1930, so before they, they began to work at Chatham. Um, up Woodland Road, Ray House was purchased. You can see it's kind of on the road woodland heading back out towards Wilkins. It was purchased as the president's home and it remains today the president's home. It's right across from the Richard Meyer house. So the, right off the, across the street from that white, you know, modern house is Ray House, which was built in 1906 in a federal style, federal revival style, and it came to the college in 1945. Um, this is also when we were Fire Baby House was in um, 1948. Again, this is the Alden Harlow shingle style house from 1894. It was purchased originally for dorms, but today it's our Institutional Advancement and Alumni Affairs building, and it was recently awarded, won an award for its preservation of the structure. Um, this effectively doubled the size of the campus, this Woodland Road expansion. 1947-53 um, is the Ingham Boyd slash Olmsted master plan, which reoriented the campus. The firms worked together in 1947 to create a master plan that involved the demolition of Barry and Dilworth, 
and the erection of new buildings to create kind of a semi-enclosed quad. Fundraising began in 1941, but again, something else happened that delayed it, the, world, the Second World War. Um, this campus plan was the first to address automobile circulation at the college, which you can imagine is a real challenge for a hilltop campus. And it continues to remain a challenge today. We're locked in by the neighborhood and you know, we've got all these large homes and very wealthy, powerful people who live in them. And whenever we propose a new parking lot, it always goes you know, down to the city and you know, all kinds of just really very difficult to park at Chatham today. I worked in Oakland at the Carnegie for about seven years before I came to Chatham. And I thought, oh good, I'm finally getting out of Oakland. I won't have to pay for parking and they charge me more for parking at Chatham than I have to pay at the Carnegie. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it's you know it's just a consistent problem, particularly since we have so many commuters now. Now the buildings that were built in this campaign, primarily in the 19, late 40s and 50s, were in the collegiate, collegiate Georgian style, and they were designed by Ingham and Boyd. And they include the chapel, which was built in 1949. Um, today, if you go up there, there's a kind of an ugly parking lot in front of it. Originally, it had a nice green area there, as you can see. Um, the Spencer House was built. That's a little tiny house on your map that's right by the stairs. It was built for the dean of the college in 1949. I don't have a slide of it. The physical education building. Oops, there's a few of these of the chapels. It's really nice. the pictures of our chapel. Here again, you can see it early on. Um, with, hmm, I figure out which one. I think that's Lachlan House in the distance. Um, this is the best picture I could get of the gym. It's really not very good. It's the side of the gym. It's the um, at, the gym is um, kind of at the far end of campus. It's, I think on the plan there it still says gym or athletic. It, anyway, what it is today is my building. It, not just my building, it's the Art and Design Center. I've got a few interior shots. It was, um, our president likes to tell the story of uh, having people come to look at the gym and one architect saying it was the nicest eighth grade gym he'd ever seen. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> it was basically one big room, a downstairs that was locker rooms and the dance studio you see here, and upstairs a large um, basketball court with some upstairs rooms on either side. And it's been beautifully um, renovated um, by Ken Doino Associates. Uh, they built a mezzanine. They left all the, the gym floor is now studio space. And they left it open to the large windows that you see on the side there. And um, there's a mezzanine that was built across the third floor level where we have classrooms. I'm sorry I don't have a picture of it. I should I do in digital form, but not unfortunately. Um, but it's, it's a wonderful building, really wonderful building to work in, and it originally was built in 1952. Um, this is from the Barry, this is old Barry Hall again. It's when it was torn down, um, 1952 to 53, um, and Ingham and Boyd's Braun Falk Coolidge Halls replaced them. Not my favorite building on campus, I think it's kind of a dull <laughs> structure compared to Barry. Um, this again is the old quad, which was meant to kind of, you know, be like arms reaching around the old quad. Um, I think this is Braun, this is Falk, and this is Coolidge. And though they're all three connected, evidently three different people paid for them. Um, uh, this is a dance in Woodland Hall. They built a new cafeteria in Woodland Hall at this time. Um, Another kind of 1950s event, also in Moulin Dining Hall. And this is when they made the girls wear beanies in the 50s. You know, those first years had to wear beanies, and there were mm -hmm. girls sitting there in Mellon with their beanies on. Um, our girls today would never put up with that. It's at this time that we first acquired the Gateway House, and I think most of you picked up the hand out on the Gateway House, but we pass it around. I don't have many good pictures of it, because it was renovated again in the digital camera age. But that gives you a timeline of what we call Gateway House, um, but was originally the Howe Child's, well, it was called the Howe Child's Gate House. When it was first built in the 1860s, it was called Willow Cottage. 
um, and it was leased by the college from Michael Benedum in 1950. And in 1960, he just gave it to the college, along with Benedum Hall, which is up on the top of the hill, and its name was Greystone Mansion. It's a building, large building in the Beaux-Arts style, and he gave the college um, seven acres of land as well, which we later lost. Um, this is an exact interior shots of Benedum. Again, I, I never seen it. It's not a white college. There was ugly times. Sorry, I don't think there, but there's ugly kind of many of them. I've got to switch over my parasols. Another shot of Benedum. The art department was up there for some time, I understand, when Jerry Kaplan was at Chatham. Um, this is at the time when the name was changed to Joe. Oh, I point this out because I'm sure you've seen this going down Fifth Avenue. The, um, there used to be a water fountain from the spring. Yeah, this was part of the Benedict Estate as well. Um, what was originally the Howe Childs Estate. This is the dining hall, again, in the 1950s, and Woodland Hall, in addition, that was built. The art department later went this there, too. We used to have a dumb order between our different sections of the art <coughs> These huge, old, I guess what they used as refrigerators at that time, these big, thick walls, almost room-sized refrigerators. <coughs> Changed to Chatham College in 1955, of course, for William Pitt, Earl of Chatham. It was changed to reflect the national focus of its recruiting uh, orientation by this time, and also to make it clear that it was an independent college, that it was not state-supported, which some people thought it was because it was a Pennsylvania college for women. Um, 1960, the second Dilworth Hall, again, Chow has his habit of tearing down buildings and then using the name again for another building. This is replacing the Mellon Orchard. And again, it's in this kind of compatible collegiate Georgian style, built in 1959 by Curry and Martin. Um, used initially as a dormitory, so you see some rolls on the outside. Today it's a classroom building for our health sciences and its faculty offices. Um, 1962 to 66 continued the Woodland Road expan expansion. Um, this is Helen Hayes. I couldn't tell the date, but I thought maybe in the 50s, 60s, came to talk to the girls. <laughs> um, here's an art class, also looks to be kind of the 50s, 60s. Um, and it was in 1960 that we acquired what is now Berry Hall. Again, what was originally the Bissell Hammond House. And it became the new Berry Hall, again, reusing a name. 1893, again, probably the oldest building on Woodland Road. And we also got named Ray House and Laughlin House in the 60s that again became dorms. So we owned all of the homes on that side of Woodland Road from Barry to Thickus. And again, most of them are dorms. This now is our admissions building. And again, Baby, as I said, was a lucky affair as an institutional advancement. 1966 to 72, the Johnston, Shoecliffe, and Merrill Master Plan. <laughs> By 1966, they began planning for a new library and an auditorium and a dining hall and a studio, student center. And in 66 to 72, this is the baby boom period. And they were getting huge enrollment at the time. The result was this structure. <laughs> Eddie Theater on the left and the J.K. Mellon, J.K. Mellon Library on the right. Um, this created a whole new quad because and now the back of Rome Falk Coolidge kind of fronted on what is today the main quad at, on the campus. And the J.K. Mellon Library is there and it's attached to the <coughs> theater. Unfortunately, um, stylistically, it's really out of keeping with the rest of the campus. But I've heard a few reasons for this. One, of course, it's in a modern style. This is the 70s. You want to be modern. Um, some complain that it looks like a spaceship that landed in the middle of a dominantly Georgian brick campus. <laughs> the other rumor is that the college president at the time wanted a miniature version of Hillman Library, which had just been built at Pitt. So it does, you can see, kind of resemble Hillman. You know, this, someone told me once you know, that Hillman has all these like, skinny windows, and Forbes Quad building next to it has hardly any windows. 
these were built in the late 60s and 70s after all of the campus unrest. And they wanted buildings that would be easy to kind of block off and defend if they needed to. Um, here's an aerial view that gives you a sense then of where we were in 1974. Here again is the old quad with the Bromfalk Coolidge Complex, uh, the Buell Science Center, Walkland mm -hmm. Hall, the chapel, and Woodland. And here you can see the two extensions that were built onto Woodland. This remains a dorm today, and um, the art gallery, the art, art gallery is there too. Um, this is where the art department used to be when I first started working there, was in one of these wings. And then you can see Hillman and um, the Eddy Heater. You can see parking, you can see the houses across Murray Hill Avenue, our friendly neighbors, and here's the Gilworth Hall. Um, so it's really, I mean, it's hanging together. Again, I, I really regret the, the loss of some beautiful old buildings. Um, the 1980s, I've seen shots of girls in the 70s. You know, in the 80s, painting, so it's I did college, which is when I was in school. In the 1980s, the college was at a low point financially. It had declining enrollment and rising costs. That it's in the 80s that they sold Benetton Hall and all of the beautiful furniture in it. Um, and the Howe Child's Gatehouse was sold in the 80s as well. Um, and a lot of the art collection was sold. I've looked through um, auction catalogs that they had for the auctions that were held at the time. The most notorious story is that we had a Corot, the French 19th century painter Camille Corot, but someone, um, an appraiser had said, oh, it's not a real Corot, it's a fake Corot. And so they, college sold it. They sold it to Jim Roddy, who had it reappraised, and discovered it was a real Corot after all. So we've lost some good things. Um, it, the college also underwent something that most women's colleges did in the, in the 1980s, which was, um, thinking about going co-ed, that Mills College you know, did, was the one that started it about 18, 1989, and Chatham went through it in the late 80s and early 90s, caused a huge alumni uproar, and that's the reason why, like so many places, Chatham did not go co-ed. Something that helped us kind of out of the doldrums in the 1980s was the Gateway Program, which helped make up some of the difference. Gateway was for women over 24, who could at the time live on campus. They lived in Beatty House. Um, you know, and I think it, it was really successful. I think in part that some older women felt more comfortable in a place like Chatham than they would going back to school, say, at Pitt, if they were in their 20s or 30s. Um, the 80s, again, a low time, deferred maintenance on a lot of buildings. Though in 1982, Pittsburgh History and Landmarks Foundation declared Woodland Road a historic district. So it is, there is a sign there, you can see that it is a historic district. I came to Chatham in the 90s, in 1996, and there was, by that point, kind of a financial turnaround due in part to the addition of co-ed graduate programs. Initially in the health sciences, uh, physical therapy, physician's assistants, occupational therapy, and then in psychology and English, and the two graduate programs we have in my division our landscape architecture and interior architecture. Our landscape architecture program was recently accredited, so it's like one of the few accredited programs in the state of Pennsylvania. 1991, we had to be ADA compliant campus wide, though they deferred it on some of the really old buildings like Mellon. In 1996, Dover Litsky Craig campus master plan. Um, and the first part of their plan was to rehabilitate and expand Buell Hall. And this is one of the architect's renderings. Again, we've got that lovely balustrade with the tremendous views of Shady Side and Celebrity. What will become someday the Rachel Carson Garden. <laughs> They're still fundraising for that. She's, of course, our most famous graduate. And then you can see old um, view here and then the new science edition. It was the first building built on campus in 25 years. Um, it was a real symbol that we were kind of coming out of something. Um, some draw here it is in reality. Um, there you can see it from the side. You have a three-story atrium where you see those windows, and that's where this Tiffany window is today. That's this is kind of overlooking that atrium. And here's the, here's our men installing our Tiffany window, which had to be majorly restored, as you can imagine, it was in really, really bad shape. 
It doesn't look the same in this picture because it's not backlit. Uh, before he came up with uh, real glass, Tiffany would put a milky white glass over, um, kind of an opaque glass over clear glass to get those different shades that we have in our windows. I love that. I'm not thrilled with the placement, to be frank. I think there's way too much exterior light shining on it. The best time to see it is at night because those big windows aren't shining on it. The lights behind it are not lit yet, so I brought back another picture of what it looks like when the lights are working. And one thing that's really lost is there's a gorgeous ruby glass around the whole out outside, and in the daytime, you can't even see it because of that big window next to it. Um, they moved the administration from Lawn to Mellon, where you'll find it today. This is the time they rehabilitated Baby House as well. And like I said, they won a 1999 Preservation Award from the History and Landmarks. Um, they also rehabilitated Berry Hall for admissions. Um, and they reacquired the gatehouse around this time. And this was something I saw from the beginning to the end. Um, they acquired it in 2000, and the, you see the kind of chronology down there. Um, the gatehouse is really important because it's the oldest structure on Fifth Avenue and the oldest frame structure in Pittsburgh. It was built by Thomas Howe, the owner of, of what preceded Greystone, for his daughter. And it wasn't really a gatehouse to the big mansion. It never was. They never called it the gatehouse, but we do. Um, it was built around 1861 to 66, after um, Thomas Howe's daughter's husband had died in the Civil War. And she had several children, and he wanted to keep her close, so he built the building for her. It was in their family until 1947, when it went to the Benedums, um, who owned it until 1959, and then gave it to Chad in 1960. We owned it until 85, and it was where um, Again, it was mostly housing for Gateway students. Um, then it was sold by the college, again, in the doldrums of the 80s, to Greystone Associations, which is the group that built those condominiums there. Um, in eight, 1988, they sold it to a private company that plans to turn it into a bed and breakfast, but they had zoning problems. They just let it basically sit there and rot. And I'm sure you remember what it looked like before. I mean, it just looked like a haunted house. Actually, someone from Hollywood came out and filmed it for <coughs> exteriors for a haunted house movie. Um, it was pretty bad when we went back inside after reacquiring it in 2000. There was a found a dead body in one of the rooms. <laughs> <laughs> it was awful. Um, and in 2000, it was put on the Save America's Treasures official project designation. Um, it began its life as a two and a half story clapboard Gothic Revival cottage. You can see it's got the gingerbread, the bay windows, the gables. Um, it had really deteriorated um, to the point where there wasn't a whole lot we could save on the inside. Um, basically, it needed to be gutted, but they saved as much as they could. Like, they saved what few of the balustrades on the um, stairway remained, and they, they hired a wood worker to recreate them. It also won a Historic Preservation Award from Pittsburgh's Historic Review Commission, and it's really beautifully done. Today, it's a place where guests stay, and they have meetings and events there. Um, they have lots of pictures of the restoration. It's really pretty interesting. Um, they also won an award, as I mentioned, for the renovation of Baby House. In 1988, um, 1998, the Pennsylvania Bureau for Historic Preservation revived the historic resource survey form for Chatham College and determined that six Woodland Road residents were historic residents. That includes Mellon, Barry, Bailey, Ray, and Lachlan. Um, so again, we're part of a, a national register for the Woodland Road Historic District. Um, we were also at that time, because of our plantings, certified institutional members of the American Association for Botanic Gardens and Arboreta. Um, we have over 300 specimen trees on campus. Um, really, again, gorgeous. Um, lots of original shrubs and plants. To the present, um, I don't have the pictures of the present again after the digital age. This was supposed to be my Arboreta picture. <laughs> when everybody started taking digital pictures, you know, bad buildings that have been built since then, I don't have any pictures of. 
But if they rehabilitated Woodland, they kicked out the art department and the theater that used to be there and put in a nice, really nice little coffee shop. So if you go up on campus and you want a cup of coffee and a light meal, right at the corner of Woodland Hall by the Braun Falk Coolidge complex, really nice little coffee shop. Put a gallery in there, which I'm in charge of. I direct the gallery as the old art historian at Chatham full time. And they built the athletic facility, which I believe is on your map. Yeah, new athletic facility. And so they turned the old gym into the arts and design division. Um, the athletic facility is state of the art. It's just gorgeous. I mean, you know, it looks like a country club. It really is. is if you haven't been in there, it's really worth just walking around. Um, the most recent construction, as I said, was this uh, rebuilding of the Mellon Terrace, which sticks off of the back part of Mellon. And two of the things they did was take over the bowling alley and turn it into a broadcast communications center. And just opening this fall was um, the Mellon Boardroom. This was the pool that was actually, this was the Mellon's original pool. Um, tiled in Guastavino tile. I don't know if anybody's heard of Guastavino. There was, it made really famous acoustic tiles. There was a show about the Heinz Architecture Center in the 90s. And they basically, I understand the pool's still there, it's been drained, but they put, you know, a floor over it and they restored all the tiles, which are just gorgeous. And now it's called the Mellon Boardroom. Um, let's see. Yeah, this, this. Um, and that's where displayed along, again, a balustrade are all four names of the college, but for some reason not in chronological order, which irritates me as a historian. But I don't remember asked me. Um, again, the new interest was in part to um, meet ADA specifications. So the current campus is 32 acres, 23 buildings, became Chatham University in May 2007. Um, and it has now three colleges, the College for Women, the College for Professional Studies, and the College of Graduate Studies. So we have these three colleges that are part of Chatham University. I know I'm running a little bit late, but let me just go real quick. The one thing most people don't realize is that Chatham has wonderful art collections, including a collection of prints of Pittsburgh that date from the late 18th to the late 19th century. This is a plan of, of Pittsburgh in 1796. It was done for the French. It wasn't published until 1826, but it shows Pittsburgh in 1796. You can see all the ravines. These are the forts, Fort Lafayette, and of course, Fort Pitt and the areas of downtown that were developed. I like, <laughs> um, there's a little inscription over here that says, point from whence one can see the rivers and the town. And it's not Washington, it's, it's then called Cole Hill. Um, but it's a beautiful hand-colored map published in 1826. Is it on Pardon? No, because the works on paper are really delicate. We bring, I'm hoping to bring them out maybe next year sometime. We had a show a while ago. These had been donated to the college in 1960. I don't think anybody did anything with them. They came from a woman whose mother was the first woman on the board of trustees. Um, and they basically sat in a drawer. And I was the first art historian they hired who was an Americanist and knew something about old prints about Pittsburgh history. So I brought them out for an exhibition a while ago. And, um, there's going to be six of them, though, in the show at the Frick. They're having a wonderful show at the Frick that I think opens at the end of the spring and runs through the summer into early fall. That are Pittsburgh prints. They have a scholar from a um, print shop in Philadelphia who's doing all the research. And he came out and looked at all of our prints. He's going to produce a catalog, which would be marvelous. And about six of our prints are going to be in that show. So if you're interested in seeing them, we have about I guess about six views of the point altogether. Some maps, some like this that came from Gleason's Pictorial Drawing Room Companion, where you can see the point to the riverboats. This was based on a painting by a man named Godfrey Frankenstein, painted it probably in the 1830s, 40s. This is a letter sheet, letterhead, that is the same view of the point, also based on the Frankenstein painting, but with some different river traffic. And you can make out some of the buildings. You can see the original courthouse, which was in the classical style, and the original St. Paul's, and I can't remember what that church is. But it's pretty accurate. This is Pittsburgh in 1840 from Grants Hill. So up on Grants Hill, this is, I believe, Liberty, and this is Penn. So you're looking down towards the point. 
And it's very faded, but it's been hand colored, so you can kind of make out some of the. We have, I could do a whole talk on our prints someday if you're interested. <laughs> I have slides of all of these. Um, this is one that's a little bit later, about we think about 1870s, because it has the Roebling Bridge. You know, Roebling, who built the Brooklyn Bridge, built the first suspension bridge here in our city before the Brooklyn Bridge, and the exposition buildings, which are on the north side where the stadiums are today. And the Mon Wharf with all of its river traffic pulled up. Um, we also have a wonderful public sculpture, most of it done by Jerry Kaplan, who passed away a few years ago. He was a professor at Chatham. This is our monument to Martin Luther King. And this is another Kaplan piece that's done by Mellon. Um, we also have, and I'm wrapping up now, I promise, we have an exhibition that's opening on Thursday, which is why I might appear somewhat frazzled. We have a wonderful collection of African art that was given to the college in 2001. It was over 600 pieces. It's actually why we built the new gallery, and because we needed storage space for this huge collection of African art. And we have a small gallery that's dedicated to, um, um, just dedicated to the oldest collection. It was given by a uh, class of 1970 uh, alum named Cheryl Holtz, who had lived in Africa for a time. So this is uh, a Yaka mask, a boys initiation mask that's going to be in the show. Um, these are two area beige, Yoruba, Yoruba, the Yoruba peoples of Nigeria have an unusually high rate of twinning. They just like, it's the highest rate of twinning anywhere in the world. And twins are especially auspicious. If one passes away, you have a ritual carver carve an image of the twin, and you treat like a living child because the twin will then act favorably for you in the spirit world. And we have about, about 20 of these, and they're often decorated with beads um, that are, connect them to particular deities. These are tiny, only about this big. Um, and even though they're children, they're usually represented with adult features. Um, we have lots of metals. This show actually highlights the non-wood. <laughs> the top says, although most of the traditional African art is dominated primarily by wood, African artists use work with a range of materials featured in the exhibition will be works of art in metal, um, fiber, leather, ivory, and our opening reception is Thursday from 4 to 6. And we're going to have good food, so <laughs> if you're interested in seeing more African art, I'm building. It's in Woodland Hall, and it's right next, it faces onto the new quad, the gallery. There's a little vestibule that sticks out from the building, and it's right next to that new coffee shop. You'll see that there's a little kind of patio there that has um, tables and chairs for warmer weather. That's the coffee shop, and we're right next to it. And hopefully, we're supposed to have good weather. It's supposed to be in the 50s, so we're we'll probably have a good crowd. Um, and it's our, the second show we've done with the collection. So, well, my big job is trying to take care of the 600 folks of African art. <laughs> okay, I'm sorry I went so long, but I hope you learned a lot. Now, if there are a few questions, we can take them. Any, any questions tonight? We've got a pretty thorough view. Uh, yeah. Are there any co-ed classes at all? Um, the undergraduate college is strictly women. There are no men in the classes that I teach. I work only with the undergrads. The graduate programs are all co-ed. So there's a lot of men around campus. There always work. We have a lot of male faculty. But um, with these co-ed grad classes, you know, there's particularly popular among men seems to be the physician's assistant program and the physical therapy program. Um, both have large, so we actually have football games on the Y now, which we never did. And, and uh, what is, how many students? Right about 1,200. And it's pretty, oh, yeah. Even, yeah, pretty evenly split between undergrad and graduate. So you can see we've got, we've only got about 600 to 700 undergrads. So we've been getting larger and larger classes, um, but the graduate programs are about the same size. Um, our last class last year was 145 first years. So I'm hoping to have more classes like that and keep building it. What price range is your tuition? Oh, it's one of the things I don't really talk about with the faculty. Um, I think it's in the 20,000s, the like upper 20,000s. We give an awful lot of grants. And I know I have a range of students, some first generation college students, and some, you know, legacies from the you know, women who went to Chatham in the past. It's interesting, Chatham's my fourth woman's college. Fourth? Third. 
Harvard Women's College. I taught at Mary Macon in Lynchburg, Virginia, and it's at um, uh, Spartanburg, South Carolina, Converse College in Spartanburg, South Carolina. So I'm very much a supporter of this idea of, of women's only education because they want to do everything. My students are setting up the show now, and they're building the pedestals and painting the pedestals, and they're hanging the lights, and you know, kind of the things that would go to men on most campuses are handled by women at Chad. Can you say something about Dilworth, Lofty Bread? Who were they? Oh, um, I know Dilworth was a wealthy person that was connected with the Berry family. Again, paid for that original Berry Hall. My understanding, Lachlan is Jones and Lachlan Steel, um, George Lachlan, and the Rays were also part of that family. Um, but I don't know how they made them. So, <laughs> don't know a whole lot about them. I, I, they really don't want the faculty in the dorms. I've been in a few of the dorms to hang paintings since I was in charge of the college collection, but I've never went upstairs in the dorm rooms or anything. Did they live in those rooms? Yes. And it was, again, like this little industrialist enclave kind of around the Mellon Mansion. Um, people who worked for him or people who knew. Um, it was really kind of a private road for the wealthy at that time. Are you still? Uh, pretty much full of American students, or do you have we some have a lot, Yeah, we have a lot of international students. We actually pride ourselves for our size on being a campus that's globally focused. We, do, we have a year of each year where we focus on a different part of the world um, that, we, that we do programming around. This is the year of Europe, Poland, Germany. So we just, I just curated an exhibition of prints by Kathy Kolditz and other German expressionists that came from the Carnegie Museum of Art as part of our year of Germany celebration. Since I've been there, we've done Africa, we've done Japan, and I've learned about Japanese prints and tea ceremonies, and it's a very enriching experience. And most of our sophomores study abroad for a few weeks in May each year. We have a lot of Asian students, I think particularly the Japanese feel maybe more comfortable sending their daughters to a women's college. Um, and we actually have a lot of students from the Middle East as well. Uh, our president travels a lot and does a lot of recruiting around the world. So <laughs> it's despite the fact that we're so small, there's a really strong international flavor at China. I have an announcement. In the spring or summer of 2009, you're going to be lecturing on prints. Oh, OK. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I just gave you a very small taste of that collection. But it's, it's really interesting because it has all the techniques that were popular in the 19th century. It has engraving, wood engraving, lithography. Um, and the collection is all about Pittsburgh. This was a woman who loved Pittsburgh. She lived in the Fox, not Fox Chapel, Swickley. And when she died in the 1960s, she gave all of these prints to the college. So that would be the time probably when the French shall be able to uh, thank you very much. Uh, first of all, I'll say something. If Chatham is really one of the preservationist oriented institutions in our community and probably in the state, and it's very much appreciated to see how they continue to use the resources that they've been given. Chatham has been a bought a bunch of the books and, and has distributed them and sold them for our Squirrel Hill book, which we also appreciate. To wrap up, we'll be here next month to hear about uh, William Richardson, uh, Henry Richardson and the jail and courthouse downtown. It's not Squirrel Hill, but a lot of you asked to have a lecture on that. Please take announcements on the walking tours and think about when you want to come and send them in. We'll take an announcement tonight. Memberships welcome. And I need a photographer or two and some help on uh, Squirrel Hill Day on April 6th. Please talk to us about that. Nice to see you. That's a Sunday. We're doing it on the weekend. Okay, nice to see all of you. Take care. Bye -bye.